talks for seven minutes. Um, and uh, I'll have uh, cards for the presenters. I'll just hold them up to the camera. Uh, when you get down to two minutes, one minute, and then zero. Um, and then after each, uh, after each uh, uh, presentation, we'll have uh, a, a, just literally a couple of minutes uh, for, for a question and, and, and response, a little discussion around each presentation, and then we'll move on uh, to the next. So um, <clears throat> each presenter is gonna, I think they're all set up to be able to share a screen so they can present their own slides if they're using slides. And, um, with that, I will go ahead and, and start. We're gonna uh, basically just go with the order which the, the uh, presenters are on the, the panel, I mean, on the, uh, the poster going clockwise. So we'll start with Otavia Benedicenti. I hope I didn't horribly mispronounce that from biology, um, who's gonna be presenting an exotic example of the transition from water to land, the immunobiology of African lungfish. So Otavia, take it away. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. So today I will present you a great example of a living fossil. So I'm a postdoc at the Irene Salinas lab. And uh, um, we basically know that the lungfish, it's, uh, it's a so-called living fossil because uh, you can see from the phylogenetic tree that it's really ancient. It appeared about uh, 400 million years ago. If you think about the humans, for example, they uh, started to appear 85 million years ago. So it's, it's really a great example of a living fossil. We also know that the lungfish is the closest ancestor of all the tetrapods because uh, it's important to understand this because it's uh, an example from uh, the transition from uh, the water to the land, as it has a dual mode of living. First of all, it can uh, live in the water, but also in the terrestrial environment. We also know that the lungfish can survive under extreme environmental conditions. It's a process so called estivation. So they, for, they form like a cocoon, uh, which covers the entire body and protects them against ex external aggressions, how it works. So basically you have here an image from a species present in Africa. So when there is no water, so the lungfish start to uh, burrow into the mud, they curl up, they reduce their metabolic activity, and they also start to produce a copious amount of mucus that at the end will harden and form the cocoon. In Africa, the uh, lungfish can stay in this state up to four years. In our lab, we decided to investigate the immunobiology of this cocoon, which is really interesting. And uh, this is a schematic view of the skin remodeling, uh, which has been recently accepted in the science advances. We start from A, where there is a free swimming lungfish, to D, when there is the lungfish which is terrestrialized. And starting from A, we know that basically uh, there are tissue reservoirs of granulocytes in the lungfish, which are the gut, the kidney, and the gonads. When uh, there is a lack of water and food, these granulocytes start to migrate from the tissue reservoirs to the skin through the peripheral circulation. And uh, they migrate into the dermis and to the epidermis. And at this stage, the B stage is start to uh, have a kind of inflammation at the level of skin. There is a loosening of the basal membrane, but we have still a lot of stem cells and the interface between the dermis and the epidermis. In C, you have the formation of the cocoon where we found uh, uh, their epithelial cells, granulocytes, but also antimicrobial peptides. And we also found a lot of uh, bacteria which were trapped in the cocoon. And then when there is the terrestrialized lungfish, we have basically a flattened epithelia and then with less stem cells and different layers of cocoon. We also perform RNA seq studies of free swimming and the terrestrialized lungfish. And uh, interesting, we uh, found recently uh, putative toxin 
present uh, in the terrestrialized skin. And we wanted to better investigate this uh, with bioinformatic analysis, expression studies, and functional analysis. So basically, this is the phylogenetic tree of this putative toxin, uh, which is uh, found in the Protopterus doloi, but we also found this in the two recently published genome of the West African lungfish, the Protopterus annectens, and the Australian lungfish, so the Neoceratus forestry. And basically, you can see that see, this putative toxin is closely uh, related to the toxins present in the sea anemones, in Vibrio cholerae, and to a lesser extent to jellyfish and shellfish. Then we wanted to perform gene organization analysis. And we actually found in the Australian lungfish that there are three different isoforms here on the bottom, while in the West African, there are two isoforms, but one is going in the forward direction and the other one in the reverse direction. It's a so-called retrotransposition. And this mechanism, it's quite interesting because uh, the uh, retrogenes can also have novel functions in comparison to the parental gene. We performed expression studies to confirm our RNA-seq analysis. And this is on the right part of the slide. So you can see that it was uh, this putative toxin really highly upregulated in comparison uh, in the contrasted terrestrial skin in comparison to the control skin. We then wanted to check uh, the expression in different tissues of the three uh, living uh, uh, lungfish. And we found it was really present in the mucus. Also in free, uh, free swimming lungfish, we wanted to check at the uh, antibody levels. So these are uh, antibodies again, generated against antigen peptides. And we found that uh, they are associated with putative stem cells at the interface between the dermis and the epidermis. This was also confirmed by in situ hybridization as well in, in this part. So you have a closer look on the left with the uh, differentiation and different uh, cell start of cell division in there. We also check uh, the similarity to different models and it's uh, closely related to a delta endotoxin, which is insecticide. And it's quite interesting because it can be linked to the mechanism of the sporogenesis and the cell division. So one of our hypotheses about this toxin. And currently we are generating uh, recombinant proteins to understand the role of this uh, Toxin because basically uh, we uh, want to know if it's uh, a toxin protective against the external environment or it's causing the inflammation itself during the process of the terrestrialization. So I would like to thank my supervisor, uh, Dr. Inerene Salinas. I also would like to thank Christopher Johnson for the help with the recombinant protein, Melissa Sanchez for the core biology facility, all the lab members, the NSF for the funding. I thank you for your attention. Of course, I thank uh, the Langfish for this amazing project. Thank you. Great, thanks very much for your presentation. Can you go ahead and unshare your screen and then we'll, great, thanks. Let's see if we have any questions. You can just, this is a small enough group. I think you can just raise your hand. Questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll proceed to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next speaker will be Roland W. Joseph, postdoctoral fellow with the Center for, the, for uh, Al Alcoholism and Substance Abuse. Or is yours? Um, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. So again, I'm Verlin Joseph. I'm a postdoc at CASA in my first year, and I'm excited to talk to you today about stigma in justice-involved women. So I'd like to begin by defining exactly what stigma is as it relates to the field of substance use. So stigma represents the complex attitudes and behaviors that interact at different levels of society, which manifests in discriminatory practices against people with a substance use disorder. Now, there are many forms and levels of stigma, but it's important to note that one of the ways individuals uh, cite feeling stigmatized are through everyday verbal indicators. So here's an example of some of that. 
So here we can see some commonly used words that are used to describe people who have problems with substances. So we can see terms like addiction, abuse, out of control, but I'd like to show you some other terms that we can use to describe these individuals. So here you can see brave, you can see career-driven individuals. And what's important to note here is that having a substance use disorder does not define the individual. So substance use has become a leading public health matter as nearly 20 million Americans have trouble managing their substance use, which results in nearly $740 billion each year in lost wages, hospitalizations, and treatment. So substance use is one of the most stigmatized conditions across the world, and it acts as a barrier to treatment, it discourages support, and it prevents intervention efforts, which negatively affect quality of life for individuals. One group especially at risk for experiencing stigma are women. And there are several reasons for this. Women that lose their children as a result of their substance use generally report greater feelings of shame and stigma compared to other groups. Furthermore, women that are incarcerated due to substance use often have harder times accessing employment, housing, and treatment services compared to men due to stigma. Unfortunately, having contact with the criminal justice system for substance use related offenses may further perpetuate the stigma that individuals already report. Much of the stigma stems from the war on drugs. So the war on drugs implemented many harsh mandatory sentences, it increased different penalties for drug use, and it marginalized many communities that were already at risk for stigma and marginalization. This resulted in increased recidivism, substance use, and adverse mental health outcomes within these populations. So despite the stigma surrounding substance use, there are several treatment options for those who want assistance. One of the most common options is relapse prevention. And relapse prevention works by teaching participants how to identify and avert potential situations where relapse may occur. So using these techniques, individuals are able to develop healthy coping skills and cognitive resistance to prevent relapse. Mindfulness-based relapse prevention also works the same way with a few caveats. So mindfulness-based relapse prevention incorporates mindfulness through practices including yoga and guided meditations that can be implemented into daily life that are promoted so that they promote individuals to really be grounded and to be focused in situations where they may negatively react to external triggers. So unfortunately, our field doesn't have a gold standard measure of stigma. So first and foremost, it's important for us to assess whether we know how to measure stigma well. Secondly, we know that there are several effective treatments for problematic substance use, but we do not know to the extent to which substance use treatment actually impacts stigma. So in order to address these scientific gaps, we recruited 105 justice-involved women that were enrolled in a residential substance use treatment center. So you can see here that not only did the women have a history of substance use, but the majority of them also reported a history of abuse, chronic depression, and nearly half our participants reported at least one previous suicide attempt. So in our study, we divided the women into two groups. So 55 received mindfulness-based relapse prevention, while the other 50 just received the relapse prevention. And our study took place over 15 weeks, and we assessed stigma using a, a scale called the internalized shame scale. So the first thing we found was that we needed to identify whether or not our measure adequately measured stigma. And what we found using different statistical tests was that we were able to conclude that the fundamental meaning of stigma did not differ across our study groups, nor did they differ or change across time. So this was great news because it meant that we can be confident that our measure actually measured what we needed to assess. Uh, and next thing we noted was that over the duration of our study, we can see here that stigma was actually reduced in both of our study groups. However, we did not find statistical differences between our study groups. So this means that our data does not suggest that one treatment reduced stigma better than the other. However, treat stigma was reduced in both treatment groups over time. We also noted that after 15 weeks of treatment, the women that received the mindfulness-based relapse therapy reported fewer drug use days and reductions in legal and medical problems. 
So moving forward, we still have a lot of work that we need to do to combat stigma. First thing we need to do is we need to decrease stigma overall by promoting knowledge around individuals that have a negative relationship with substance use. So in fact, other studies were done and many of these studies results indicate that individuals in the public believe people with a substance use problem are more dangerous than they actually are. So because of that, we also need to rethink how we penalize individuals that use substances. And a lot of work is being done to target policies and laws from the war on drugs, but the field still needs empirical data and support to aid these endeavors. And lastly, we need to rethink our language. So this is through what we call first person, person first language. So rather than calling someone an addict, we should refer to them as a person first. So a person who has a bad relationship with a substance. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge my lab mates and everyone who's put in a lot of work at, uh, and time in this project, uh, including my, my primary mentors, Dr. Pearson and Dr. Wickowitz, and the study participants for their time in this study as well, and everyone at CASA. Thank you, everyone. Um, here's my contact information, and I'll take any questions at this time. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? I have one. Um, this is Mary Jo. Thanks for that presentation. And I'm curious, how does one affect such an embedded stigma in the public consciousness in any sort of real time? <laughs> So, so first, it's it's, a, it's an uphill battle, um, and it's going to take quite some time to uh, affect stigma. But I think it starts, first and foremost, with language, right? So it's the encouragement of using person-first language, person-centered language, so that we aren't just calling an individual by a disorder. So I think that's the first step we take, and I think downstream, eventually we'll get to the point where we can eradicate stigma in all walks of life. Thank you. And there is a question in the chat, which Bill, I don't know if you're reading it, but. <laughs> That's from me. My name is Teresa Neely. I'm just wondering if you looked at intersectionality because the differences between women of color and white women, I'm sure are startling and the treatment might be different. So did you look at that in your data analysis? So for this, um, our sample primarily came from the Pacific Northwest. So we didn't necessarily have the statistical power to identify those type of differences, but that is something that's very important to consider moving forward. And it's something that I do plan to incorporate in my work. Thank you. Any other questions? I do have a quick question. So uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Do you think that uh, more than policies would be good to start uh, from the high school level or even before uh, with education and try to, uh, to better um, speak with, the, for example, the children and so on, so, so then they are aware from the young age about this problem instead of reaching the adults? Yeah, I agree. So one of the best ways to combat stigma is through contact and, and just conversation. So um, as long as we have these treatments or we have these, these programs that are geared towards early stage individuals, younger individuals that are appropriate, of course, I think they're very beneficial because they increase contact and increase knowledge so that as individuals age and progress through life, they don't carry on these negative stereotypes. Do you have any evidence of how does that actually change attitudes? So I don't have, have evidence. So I don't have evidence this from this data set, but there have been a number of mixed okay. methods that suggest that attitudes over time may potentially change. Okay, that's good. I think Thank have, you. Jeff Tonigan has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great talk, Merlin. I really appreciate it. Did you, were you able in this data set to look at what is the correlation between your stigma score and substance use? So we didn't, we didn't for this data set, but that's gonna be the next step because what was promising is over time, we did see reductions in stigma, as well as with the mindfulness-based group, we did see reductions in legal issues, medical issues as well. So we, we, we didn't assess that just yet, but that will be the next step. Great, well, thanks very much. Um, 
for, for your presentation and, and, and also all the questions and, and responses. Great discussion. We could probably spend half an hour just on your paper. <laughs> sure. Thank you, everyone. Um, okay, so our ne next up is, is uh, Liz Godwin, postdoctoral fellow in electrical and computer engineering. Right, it's over to you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this Lightning Lounge. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. So first, I'd just like to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about my background. And um, so start off, I'm a material scientist, as well as the engineering education researcher. I started with my education at Florida Agriculture and Mechanical University with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Um, my Advanced studies was in material science engineering, focusing on electronic materials. With that background, um, upon finishing my um, dissertation, I worked at Intel for roughly 10 years, both as an engineer and as an engineering manager, where I worked on everything from electronic processes to the research and development of substrates um, for these particular um, devices. When my family moved to Idaho, I started, I changed to academia and I started working at Boise State University. So a lot of the research that I will be discussing today um, was done at Boise State um, within the Advanced Nanomaterials and Manufacturing Lab. Um, also, um, I've had a chance to teach both as a clinical professor um, in a mechanical engineering department at Boise State, as well as as an adjunct professor here at UNM. Currently, I'm teaching um, an honors course and also developing the honors program for the School of Engineering. Currently, I'm a visiting scholar as part of the UNM Inclusive Excellence Postdoctoral and Visiting Scholars Program. So let's talk about it. Some of the research that um, I will get in today um, focuses on advanced manufacturing as in the application into capacitive strain gauges, as well as my interest in engineering education research. So um, because I'm focused on electronics, um, I want you to get an idea of why this area of research is so important. Um, the future of electronics um, will definitely be impacted or felt in the healthcare industry. Um, there's lots of biosensors that have been developed, as well as when you think about automotive displays, um, almost every um, automotive on the market today has some sort of um, capability. Um, for smart communications um, or connections. Um, the future will see devices where um, they become more conformal and integrated into the structure of the automobiles. Additionally, um, tablets are also um, developing over time where now um, we're starting to see them where they're flexible, but also bendable. Um, all of this um, advancements in these technologies depend upon um, having a flexible substrate that can also um, work as an electronic device and um, transfer signals, um, most of them wirelessly, um, as they are now in, connected through the Internet of Things. Um, this surge of electronics um, requires us to think about how we're manufacturing these electronic devices. So traditionally, um, we use a mass process that takes several different steps and is usually called a very hard substrate. Um, but there's this type of advanced manufacturing called aerosol jet printing. Um, it's a relatively new technique uh, with it being developed in the early 2000s. Um, it allows you to print a lot of these high resolution electronic circuits and components um, using um, a 3D method. Um, the advantage is that um, it uses a minimal feature size. Um, a lot of the um, equipment that um, supports aerosol jet printing is developed through Automac. Um, and so one of the huge advantages of being here in New Mexico, and um, this is also where this company is based. So I look forward to collaborating with this company even further in my research. Um, so a little bit more about aerosol jet printing. Um, this is um, the actual printer that we use uh, within our lab um, to actually make the devices. Um, aerosol jet printing rely upon CAD drawings as opposed to a mask and the more traditional semiconductor process. 
Um, the advantages of using aerosolject printing is that you will have a very cost efficient process and it's easy to update. So rather than um, redeveloping masks, you are now just re um, editing your CAD drawing. Um, because there's less waste, it's environmentally printing and um, it relies upon nanoparticle ink. So some of the research and development we have done is into um, these inks that are used to print, print these devices. So a little bit about the research that I was completing. Um, I had a project where I was collaborating with NASA Johnson Space Center uh, with Dud Licken. So what you see in this particular here is is an inflatable structure. This is an example of a structure that will be deployed um, during re-entry process. And so during the re-entry process, you can imagine that you're going to be faced with different pressures, different temperatures, um, very rapidly in different environments. This requires real-time monitoring to ensure the structural integrity of not only the device, but whatever the um, structure is protecting as it lands back into the atmosphere. So um, we develop flexible capacitance-based strain gauges. Um, it's based upon the theory of capacitance, um, which is um, gets into the dimensions of your particular device, which then you can actually tailor um, the capacitance and your sensitivity of your device. So we develop the geometry um, based upon the theory for uh, capacitance. And these are the actual strain gauges that we were developed. And as you can see, the gaps and as well as the line spacing is really small. Um, our resolution for these particular devices went down to 20 microns, which is necessary for the um, sensitivity and the accuracy of these measurements. Um, the goal of our project was to take these strain gauges um, that are really small in nature and attach them to these structures. And this will enable us to get real time and more accurate results. Um, the state of the art at this time are rigid um, resistance based strain gauges. And so this work will allow us to get more accurate measurements as well as it's a non-destructive method because it actually conforms to the surface. These are just the beginning of our results where we're looking at capacitance versus strain. And so you can see as um, we change the orientation, we get um, different strain response. Um, as a result of this, we're definitely um, continuing work. We're looking at um, adding a dielectric, which hopefully increase the capacitance as well as um, changing the geometry of our capacitance strain gauge as well to also increase the um, sensitivity. Another area of research that I want to go in very quickly is engineering education research. And um, this is an area that I particularly interested in because I want to increase the broadening participation um, through this research. Um, at Boise State, we found that NSB students involved in research were more likely to stay in their engineering programs, which supports similar research by other scholars. And so we will continue this research um, looking not only at um, engineering, but other STEM fields. So I am looking for collaborations. So I just wanted to kind of highlight the areas where I'm looking to collaborate. Um, definitely continuing advanced manufacturing, nanomaterial synthesis, as well as engineering STEM education. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Are there questions? Seeing applause. Hi, Liz. This is Mary Jo. Um, so I'm curious in terms of the the printing, the um, I've already forgotten the jet printing that you do. <laughs> Aerosol. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you're, you know, the the thing you you did for NASA was sort of on a big scale, right? You were working. So are these things? sort of biocompatible, like can we be printing things that we will put on our bodies as sensors that will not make us um, turn green or anything? 
<laughs> yes, um, we um, actually another part of the research that I did was with graphene based inks, which are known to be biocompatible as well. And so um, there's a lot of biosensors that are being developed. And so having a way to print these onto a not only flexible, but biocompatible substrate. Um, this is something this method allows because you can adjust the temperature as needed, but it also allows you to have the environments that uh, bio um, materials would thrive in as you actually develop these devices. So presumably there would be some medical applications and perhaps drug delivery applications, possibly? Yes, for sure. Both of those. Thank you. That was interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Godwin. That was really interesting. But in, in some cases, the dearth of questions reflects um, the technicality of the subject. Uh, I wouldn't know how to frame a question, um, but thank you very much. Um, so our next presenter is Emily Morin, or Morin, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, um, uh, postdoctoral fellow in cell biology and physiology, uh, speaking on cholesterol regulation of vasoreactivity. Morin. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today with all of you. Um, this is my first time at the Lightning Lounge, so hopefully not the last time. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about cholesterol regulation of vasoreactivity. Um, so when most people think about cholesterol, they think about um, how too much cholesterol can lead to heart disease and block your arteries. So you eat a lot of junk food. This leads to plaque buildup in your arteries and then can lead to a heart attack or a stroke. However, cholesterol isn't always the bad guy. Um, so we really need cholesterol in order to survive. Um, our brain uses a lot of cholesterol um, and cholesterol is also used to synthesize things such as hormones and vitamins. Um, it aids in digestion and bile acids. It's also needed for cell growth. Um, one particular vitamin that everyone probably knows about is vitamin D and how we need sunlight to make that. Well, cholesterol is a precursor molecule um, in this reaction. So without cholesterol, we don't get vitamin D. And that being said, um, cholesterol is also a very important component of cell membranes. So our body is made up of billions and trillions of cells. Each one of these cells is surrounded by a membrane that keeps everything intact. Um, and these membranes are made up mostly of lipids known as phospholipids, but cholesterol is also an important um, part of these membranes and it allows the cell membrane to maintain um, its structure. Um, it can alter the fluidity or the rigidity of the membrane. And it also helps anchor important proteins into the membrane um, so that they can signal and sense things on the cell surface in order to, uh, for the cell to respond. That being said, uh, cholesterol in vascular cell membranes can greatly alter the ability of blood vessels to dilate and constrict. And what I mean by that um, is the relaxation and the um, tensing up of an artery. So when you think about the diameter of your artery at rest, it has a basal level of tone, which means it's not completely dilated like we see on the left. Um, but it does have a slight constriction, but it can also constrict further, um, uh, decreasing the diameter of the vessel lumen. Um, so you can imagine as a blood vessel dilates, it allows more blood to flow through. As it constricts, it allows less blood to flow through. Um, now, this is um, of importance because cholesterol in endothelial cell membranes, which line your blood vessels, can influence vasoreactivity. So cholesterol, um, can do this in a different uh, number of different ways. One can be direct binding to different proteins on the membrane surface. So you can see this is just a very generic example um, where these little cholesterol molecules are bound to this transporter channel and that causes the channel to be closed. Um, conversely, cholesterol when unbound to the channel will allow it to open up and for ions or signaling molecules to um, 
to flow into or out of the cell. Um, I should say that cholesterol is not always inhibitory. There are some cases where binding of cholesterol is necessary to open the channel. It can also act indirectly, as I had mentioned previously, um, by altering the membrane fluidity or anchoring proteins into the membrane. So some proteins in the membrane need to be able to move back and forth in order to interact with other molecules um, at the cell surface so that they can be active. Um, so in some cases, increased cholesterol in the membrane can sort of prevent the movement of proteins at the surface um, and therefore limit their interaction and signaling. Now, why do we really care about this? Um, well, a arterial tone or that like resting level of constriction or dilation really determines the distribution of blood flow to your tissues. Um, so when we think about uh, cardiovascular disease um, and high cholesterol, this is mainly a large vessel disease. So you see here this aorta. So that's typically where you see those plaques and blockages. And while that is definitely detrimental, um, higher elevated cholesterol in your plasma or your blood can also increase the cholesterol in the membranes of cells in your arterioles. And your arterioles are smaller vessels, but the ability of these vessels to constrict and relax is very important because these vessels control um, blood flow and perfusion of your vital organs. Um, so if your organs are not getting enough blood flow or enough oxygen or enough nutrients, this can be detrimental and pathological. So to just give you a brief introduction of what I'm kind of going to be talking about here. Um, so your artery wall is made up primarily of two main cell types that I'll be focusing on. So the very inside of your artery wall or the lumen is lined with the single layer of endothelial cells known as the endothelium. Um, now, um, beneath the endothelium um, is some connective tissue, but also this layer, multi-layer of smooth muscle cells. So these, like any other muscle, can contract, and these are the primary machinery of the contraction and relaxation of your arteries. And the interaction between the endothelium and the smooth muscle is really what drives um, vasodilation or vasoconstriction in some uh, situations. So one um, protein or ion channel that I am studying in my postdoc is known as TRPV4. So TRPV4, it's a transient receptor potential vanilloid receptor of type four, which you don't really need to know for this, but um, it conducts calcium ions um, into the cell and the increase of this calcium or the conductance and then subsequent increase in calcium inside the endothelial cell can then activate downstream pathways that communicate with smooth muscle cells to cause them to relax. Interestingly, TRIP before also has these identified cholesterol binding sites um, on the protein, so it has the potential to be regulated by membrane cholesterol. So our hypothesis, very vaguely, is that endothelial cell membrane cholesterol will limit TRIP before mediated vasodilation. And we can study this using a technique called pressure myography. So um, in an animal, we can isolate um, single ar arteries or arterioles and mount them in between these two fluid-filled cannulas. Now these cannulas, you tie them off and you can flow substances through the artery. You can pressurize it to a physiological pressure. And then we can also flow um, uh, uh, buffers or solutions of drugs into the lumen or in the superfusate, which is the buffer that surrounds the vessel. And I have a little video here to kind of show you um, what it looks like when we're looking at these things. We mount this um, chamber onto a video microscope and then with software, we can detect the, um, the diameter of the lumen. And so this is just kind of what you would see. So you have it at rest and then you might add a drug that would cause constriction or dilation and give it a second here and it'll do something like that, right? And we can record this over time. Um, so in, in my case, I'm looking at trip V4 and cholesterol. So um, we can create these dilation curves. Um, and so ACH is acetylcholine and acetylcholine pathways can activate trip V4 and cause dilation. So we do a dose response curves. So vehicle is just no treatment 
And you can see that at rest um, under vehicle conditions, you get this nice um, dose dependent dilation. However, if we load the vessels, the endothelial cell um, with cholesterol and then do this experiment, we see that the dilation is blunted. So it takes a little bit more acetylcholine to get um, a similar response as uh, a normal resting vessel. Conversely, if we deplete cholesterol from the endothelial cell membranes of our vessels and then subject them to the same dose response curve, we can see that we see enhanced activity or enhanced dilation. Um, and in these studies, um, we were using specific inhibitors and controls to show that these effects are TRPV4 specific, um, but I did not include those details because I didn't want to confuse everybody. Um, but basically what we can see is that by manipulating cholesterol in these vessels, in the endothelial cells, um, we can see marked differences in their ability to dilate or constrict. Um, so briefly what I've like to summarize is that cholesterol is an important component of cell membranes and it's not just um, you know associated with bad food and blocking your arteries. Um, specifically endothelial trip 4 channels are inhibited by endothelial membrane cholesterol in these resistance sized arteries. And this is important because under pathological conditions where you might have high circulating um, LDL cholesterol or high plasma cholesterol, um, your vasoactivity may be impaired um, due to decreased activity of these ion channels such as TRPV4. Um, uh, so with that, I would like to thank um, everyone here today for attending. Um, I would also like to thank my mentoring team, my mentor, Jay Naik, um, and then Laura gonzalez Boss and Nancy Kanegi, who are co-mentors of mine, as well as the rest of the vascular physiology group here. Um, I'd like to thank my funding. I'm part of the um, ACERT ERACTA program here. Um, as well as a former trainee on the cardiovascular research training program here as well. And of course, um, the Department of Cell Biology and Physiology. Um, my contact information is here. So if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or stop by my office if I'm here. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take uh, questions. Thanks very much. Uh, stop share. Yeah. I swear, after a year or two of using Zoom, I still get caught up. Yeah, I, I found the mute button, so I was working on myself for that. Um, so, uh, any, any questions? Dr. Uh, so, uh, I'll ask one. Where, where might this lead in terms of uh, treatment uh, for, for people with cardiovascular disorders? Does this point to, you know, hazards of the common practice of medicating people to reduce cholesterol? Like what, what are the potential, I know this is basic research, but sort of what are, what are the potential um, uh, treatment implications? Right, and I think that's a great question. Um, I think right now, um, the goal is to really bring the attention to um, membrane cholesterol in these smaller arteries, because when you talk about high cholesterol and cardiovascular disease, it, people are focusing on large arteries, your aortas, um, and the plaques that build up there. And while most of the lipid lowering treatments to date are specifically to lower cholesterol in order to reduce these plaques in your arteries, but we know that um, the systemic vasculature and the smaller arteries are also very important in, of course, controlling blood flow to tissues, such as um, like diabetes, you get a lot of stiffening arteries, um, and that can lead to necrosis of different limbs. Um, and membrane cholesterol uh, surely plays a role in a lot of those processes as well. So I think maybe, of course, if you have elevated cholesterol, you wanna reduce that, but I think it's just more to shift the focus on looking at the whole picture and, and kind of these other areas that, that cholesterol may be affecting the body other than just your circulating lipoproteins and, uh, uh, aortic plaques. Okay, thanks very much. So one ditto to my question. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Very interesting, um, important work. Um, 
Our next presenter will be Emmanuel Asonye, postdoctoral fellow in Africana Studies, uh, saying a talk, uh, My Hero Is You, promoting deaf human rights in the COVID-19 era. Dr. Asonye, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ima Asonye. Um, I'm glad to be presenting before you this afternoon. Oh, let me get my share. Okay. I'm a postdoc with Africana Studies. I'm a linguist and I'm working on sign languages, indigenous sign languages of the world. And my project is to um, document, develop, and um, provide access to literacy for deaf children that have little or no access to sign languages, uh, you know, when they were born, especially those that are born in um, hearing families. Um, so our study over the six years we've been working in, in, in Africa and in collaboration with other researchers in other um, communities like the Papua New Guinea, uh, we have found out that a lot of their children in some of the remote areas um, have little or no access to language in, within the first five years of their lives. And um, we are relying on a lot of um, studies that I have uh, suggested that this uh, level of access, lack of access to language in, in the early childhood development leads uh, potentially leads to cognitive development. And of course, you know, it, 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 it leads to um, linguistic, um, um, uh, sorry, cognitive deficiency and also linguistic um, deficiencies. So um, what are we trying to do with um, the project My Hero Is You? Um, uh, project My Hero Is You is a literacy book on COVID-19 that has been um, translated into 104 languages. And the book is uh, supported by interagency, the standing committee, and in collaboration with other um, uh, organizations that are looking on uh, looking at mental health of children, especially with regard to COVID. Of course, um, all of us are we can relate with the impact of COVID in our lives, in our families. And but what we do not um, often think about is the impact of COVID and possibly other um, natural disasters and pandemics uh, on children. That, that have hearing impairment or children that have little or no access to language, literacy, and, and communication. And I want to wish you happy International Day of Sign Languages because today is International Day of Sign Languages as observed by the WFD and um, um, the United Nations, WFD is the World Federation of the Deaf, and in collaboration with other deaf bodies across the world. And today, um, the event today is really uh, at the crux of my work because I'm working on uh, promoting deaf literacy amongst deaf children, especially those that have little or no access to um, sign languages. Um, so the project My Hero Is You has been translated into these four, 104 languages, and I have also worked with my team to translate it into um, my own spoken language, which is Igbo. I come from Nigeria. I speak Igbo, and I grew up in my community acquiring Igbo, learning English in school, and uh, learning English all through my school days, uh, but um, having Igbo as my linguistic and cultural identity. And I know what it means to um, know about children who grow up with little or no linguistic identity, or I mean, that cannot identify with anyone because of their um, deafness. And also, in addition to make it worse, because they are born in hearing families where uh, parents and siblings do not um, sign. So when the uh, My Hero Is You book came out and uh, we worked on it on Igbo language and we decided to work on it in um, uh, sign languages in Nigeria. The reason is because um, sign, the issue of sign language in Nigeria is a very complicated thing. And also by extension in some African countries as can be witnessed by some of my colleagues, Dr. Mary Edward, who is working on Adam Rube sign language, which is one of the oldest sign languages that has been ever um, cited in literature. And um, so she can testify in some of our work, people like uh, Victoria Nice, 
also have done a lot of work in that language. And I want to relate, so for some of you who may have heard about the Mathers Vineyard, um, the Adam Robe uh, Deaf Village is uh, likened to Mathers Vineyard in the United States, where the um, level of uh, deafness genetically was very, very high, and people were reproducing deaf children because they were marrying uh, you know one another and they were having you know this reoccurrence of genetic deafness and uh, eventually anyway uh, in Adam Rubi today it is the, the government itself uh, is enacting policies that would kind of uh, stop that and possibly uh, reduce the population of the um, deaf community and uh, so in I, I don't know to some extent that was the issue in Martha's Vanya but um, eventually, the Mother's Vineyard um, Deaf Village is no longer uh, popular today because it's not really in existence. All right, so I want to play with uh, for you just the um, sample of what we have done um, this particular time. And this is a video of the translation into indigenous sign language of my hero issue. Just a few minutes of it, and I will conclude. One moment, let me share my sound so that you are able to get that. All right. And the best scientist in the world. But even Sarah's mom cannot find a cure for the coronavirus. What does COVID-19 look like? Sarah asks her mom. COVID-19 or the coronavirus is so tiny We can see it, said. Sorry, since my network is glitching, you may not enjoy the video as much. The video is deposited on YouTube and it was premiered today. And I just want to conclude by um, telling you what the, um, a few things about the video and the participants in the project. These are deaf people who are bilingual by our um, uh, assessment of who they are and, and their linguistic um, identity. They sign the conventional sign language that they learned in school, which of course is um, they, um, they learn it as a subject, but they grew up in communities where they already acquired indigenous sign languages and we trained them over time. And right now we are working with them to document the indigenous sign languages that they, they grew up with. And why are we doing this? It is because in Africa, much of Africa and a lot of other communities, there is an influx of foreign sign languages that are taking over um, you know, the indigenous sign languages. And this, in our, according to our study, is causing what we call language deprivation, um, bringing um, uh, little or no access to language and cognition for deaf people, for deaf children who are growing up in some certain communities. So our end game is to develop um, what we call indigenous sign language app, app that will be deposited online and also that is going to work with mobile device. And when we succeed in doing that, the book, uh, My Hero Issue, is going to be one of the uh, literacy materials that will be deposited there so that deaf children and their families will have access to, you know, language content in a way that, I mean, that not all of them can use internet and all the maybe mobile device, but when we get to that level, we know how to step it down. But what we want to do is one, preserve this language content, two, create access to a sign language for deaf children, because sign language is a mother tongue of you know deaf people. And so um, I am working with a, a research grant of five thousand dollars that was um, given to me by the um, research um, office of research. Uh, of U University of New Mexico, and um, we, we intend to be able to 
develop the prototype for this sign up. By the end of the year, we are going to be able to showcase what we've been able to do with this. Um, thank you for listening to my presentation. Great. Thanks very much for the presentation. You know, if you don't mind, if you could uh, copy the link of the to that to that video and maybe drop it into the chat, uh, folks could, could could grab that uh, and view it directly. Um, I've seen parts of one of your videos or a previous presentation. It was it was um, very 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 moving to see. Um, so, uh, are there any questions? But it's spray. I have one. This is Mary Jo again. Ima, it's nice hey. to see you. Thank you Thank for you, sharing. And um, so how many indigenous sign languages are there that you're going to try to document? We're going big. We want to document as much as we're going to lay our hands on. So the sign up is going to be divine and de designed in a way that it will have um, a progressive um, update capacity whereby any language that we document, we deposit. Any community that we that you know work with us and we're able to document their language, we deposit. So right now we are working with the indigenous Nigerian sign languages and we have um, signed a pact with the deaf community in Zambia to also step up to Zambia to work to document theirs. And uh, with our connection in um, Ghana, Adam Rebbe Sign Language, we also hope to deposit Adam Rebbe Sign Languages as the first, these are the first language content we are hoping to get into the sign up and then we expand it as time goes on. And, and are the indigenous, the different indigenous sign languages very, very different within a region? So yes and no. From, from our experience in Nigeria, in fact, one of the things we experienced in this documentation um, trip that I, I made, the deaf people came, they thought they had these diversified, you know, different linguistic um, systems. And when they came together, signing, eventually that lady that you saw beginning in the beginning of the video, um, on the second day we were doing appraisal, we're like, um, what have you learned? She said, I'm surprised that all of them are copying my sign. I don't know why. So they all got confused. One of them was like, okay, I'm glad that I, I, I go before you to the stage. So I don't know why you think I'm copying your sign. So we laughed. At the end of it, I told them, you people have come to learn that what you thought was, you know, these, um, you had different, you know, varieties of signing system you are coming to learn that they have similarities and they are kind of copying from one another, if you might use that word. So, I mean, with that experience, I could say um, they might be more related than we thought. Thank you. We had a question in the chat. Um, uh, do you happen to know if similar efforts are underway for native communities in the Northern hemisphere um, or will this effort include those communities if they show interest in referring to North America specifically. Hold on. Um, for whatever reason, my, my video is refusing to go away so that I see the chat. Okay. Yeah, it was just a question about whether whether you're whether you hope to extend this project to, to North American uh, absolutely uh, yes communities that have their own uh, signed languages. Yes. Absolutely, because um, I mean, what I am going to be relying upon is collaborations. Um, I have done it, you know, a work a few years ago with um, a lady who worked on Papua New Guinea sign languages, and um, she, she happened to find some of the similarities in what we're finding in Nigeria. And so, any community that is willing to have their indigenous signing systems documented, we are willing to work with them. And I'm really, really eager to step into um, the Americas, especially living in the United States and in New Mexico, you know, looking into the Navajo, possibly um, indigenous sign languages and all that. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe Morford, go ahead. Hi, Ima. Thank you very much for uh, yet again a really interesting and fascinating study. I think 
it's important to point out that this work is really groundbreaking because even here in the United States, there's a lot of variation in American Sign Language that has not been documented. So doing this work, you know, across oceans and, um, and showing us the implications for the importance of this work here in the United States is just fantastic because they're here in New Mexico, there's a lot of variation in the way that American Sign Language is used and they're not different signed languages, they are variations, but we also have signers of Mexican Sign Language who enter the state and have placements here. And so there's a lot of contact between Mexican Sign Language and American Sign Language here and in Texas, but not in other regions of the US. So it's just a fascinating topic and it's hardly been studied here in the US. So it's exciting to see that the work you're doing in Nigeria is gonna lead the way for all of us here. Thank you, Ima. Thank you, Jill. I'm so grateful and I'm happy to see you again here today. I have a question about how, um, how communities or maybe larger aggregations, provinces, states, et cetera, um, can, what resources can they mobilize to, to help prevent the situation that you described at the outset of a child growing up in a hearing family who is basically not exposed to language for, in some cases, years. Like, what does it take to try to reduce how often and how long that happens? Um, uh, so communities are uh, usually are made, are made up of native speakers who are equipped to, you know, acquire their language and speak it without thinking twice. They wake up, you sleep, you dream, you speak your language, right? But you don't know how the language works. And it doesn't concern you, of course, it doesn't break your head. But there are certain people who have been trained to, you know, know the pathway and the roadmap towards um, either saving a language, revitalizing a language, or you know, updating a language. So communities are liable to work with um, trained linguists in that regard, and possibly organizations that are also willing to spend money in in that area of study. Usually, that's what communities do. And it, it, I need to point out that, of course, I, as a linguist, as a researcher, I can't document any community's language without the approval of that community. So communities are an important piece in documenting any piece of language. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our scheduled time. I very much appreciate our presenters. I wanna, I wanna particularly thank the Office of the Vice President uh, for Research for organizing this event, but also for the broader week-long effort to, to recognize postdocs. Um, you all do amazing work, um, pillars of, uh, of, of our community of scientific inquiry. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you're being correctly recognized this week. Um, and I just wanna give a shout out to the OVPR for, for taking the lead on that. Um, so thank you all for being here today. And um, I, I look forward to seeing you all again and, and interacting with you. I do hope that uh, those of you who are here today will, will be able to come to uh, some of the faculty uh, 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 lightning lounges as well and, and interact with the faculty from across campus. It's, it's always amazing to me to see the range of different scholarship that goes on at, at, at UNM. So uh, thank you very much for being here.